this is Catherine Ayer. She'll be our lead glassmaker for the demo. My name is Jamie. I'll be assisting Catherine and narrating you through our glassmaking process. To get started, Catherine has collected clear molten soda lime glass from the melting furnace. The glass in the melting furnace is at 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the glass glows or radiates its own light. And that's why it looks yellow or orange, but it is just clear glass. Catherine collected the glass on the end of a hollow stainless steel pipe or glow pipe. It's kind of like a big metal straw. And that's what's going to let her send air out into the molten glass. Before we get to our starter bubble, we want to shape and center that glass on the end of the iron, making sure that it's nice and even in an effort to create a nice even bubble. Now keep your eyes on the glass. Catherine's using our auto inflator, which means she's blowing glass with her toes. There's a foot pedal on the floor. <coughs> she steps on the foot pedal, it activates that compressed air system, and it sends air through that tube connected to the back end of the pipe and creates our starter bubble. If you can talk, you have the lung power to inflate glass. It's very soft and fluid, up around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It moves kind of like honey. As it cools down, it sets up and becomes more rigid. So as long as your glass is hot enough, it's very, very easy to inflate. A gentle air pressure is all we need. Once we create the starter bubble, we're gonna let the glass cool down so that it's sturdy and rigid enough that it can support a second gathered glass. Because the glass moves like honey at 2,000 degrees, we can't gather all of the material we need in a single visit to the furnace. We have to build it up in layers, or what we call gathers. Inside the furnace, there is a crucible or big ceramic bowl full of molten glass. We plunge the starter bubble below the molten surface, rotate nice and evenly, and we can draw out that next layer of glass. We get exponentially more material each time we gather simply because the starter bubble has more surface area than the face of the pipe. So every time we gather, we kind of get exponentially more material. Two gathers of glass is actually plenty to make a nice sized piece, so Catherine's going to move right along. Every tool she touches to the surface of the glass is going to cool the glass down. You control the glass by controlling the temperature. The movement or the fluidity of the glass, the melting furnace, is determined by that temperature. If we raise the temperature up over 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, we can get it to move more like olive oil. As the temperature lowers, it sets up and becomes rigid. So as Catherine shapes and evenly distributes that second gather over the core bubble, it's cooling down. The core bubble is wrapped in 2000 degree glass, so that's going to start to heat up. Once the temperature is even throughout, the glass will move all at the same rate. The air that we send out into the glass is always going to take the path of least resistance. So wherever the glass is hottest, that's where it's softest, and that's where it's going to inflate. On the screens around the stage, you're going to get a couple up-close views. This is inside our reheating chamber. The reheating furnace is 2100 degrees Fahrenheit as well, um, and it is just a chamber of heat we'll use to warm the glass back up as we go. The rings that you see are doorways that open up to accommodate different shapes of glass. Um, but either way, just a reheating unit. Over here we have some optic molds. We don't have a good view there. Sorry about that. Oh, actually, I think we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, forgot we put that map. So we have a nice view of our optic mold as we inflate the bubble within them, but you get a really good view of the texture now as we go in for that reheat. So the cold metal of those optic molds freezes the texture into the surface of the bubble. We rely on a good strong core heat to be able to further inflate the glass. We don't want to heat the glass up too much because it actually softens or balls up as it's heated, and we don't want to melt out that texture we took the time to create. So we rely on that good, strong core. Every move the glass maker makes translates out into the glass. Gravity is always affecting the material. The constant rotation of the pipe is how we keep the glass on the center. Fresh out of the furnace when it's moving around like honey, that's how we keep it up off the floor, that constant rotation. Tilting the glass towards the floor, we know it's going to stretch and lengthen. Pointing it up towards the ceiling, we know it will squat back or slump into a more oval or flattened shape. So every move that we're making is intentional to affect the shape. Catherine has added a constriction line into the bubble right off the end of the pipe. That constriction line is sometimes called a jack line. These hand tools here are the jacks. We use the heel and the blades of the tool. So that's the jack line up there at the top. The smaller that line is, the easier it is to guarantee a nice clean break away from the pipe later on. We are going to crack and break the glass, and that constriction line sets a predetermined weak point into our form. 
just like the crease in a candy bar, the little squares snap apart very easily because of that predetermined heat point in the chocolate. We're setting a predetermined heat point into the glass. <coughs> the next thing we're going to do is add some fit work to our form. So that's our central form, and that's the glass flowing part of the process. Next, we'll start some fit work to create the base for our piece. Now we can simply flatten the bubble, that would work. We can add material and sculpt out the base. In this case, we're going to add a little bit of material to create, I think, a stem and a foot, or maybe just a foot. Catherine will center and shape that glass. And then when she's ready, she'll let me know I can help out. We'll actually divide that column of glass into what will become the stem for our piece. Yes. So we'll just quickly squeeze this hourglass form and create a landing pad for the next bit of glass that will become the foot. So bit work works through temperature control, our central form, the main body of our piece, nice big optic bubble, allowed to cool down so that it's rigid enough and it's not going to move around. We can add that next bit of glass that becomes the stem. We want to shape the stem out and every tool drew some heat out of it. It's cooling down. Once it's cool enough, but it's rigid enough, we can add another gather of glass to the bottom of the piece to create the foot. Temperature and timing are key in glass making. Catherine, as the lead glass maker on the team, is responsible for the steps and the timing. So I look to her before I gather that glass from the furnace. She'll let me know when it's time to move on to those next steps. is called casting on and casting off, winding the glass over itself, pulling it to a fine thread. It actually melts free. It looks kind of like it just snaps free. And then she's going to use a Swedish style pudding tool to create that base. It's two boards hinged together. Catherine makes this tool look pretty easy to use, but it's actually extremely tricky to work with. This is a brand new one. That's why it's so smoky. Discs on the bottom of the piece will work together, wedging the glass between a board and the blades of the jacks to create the final shape. We're looking for a little bit of a concave there in the middle. The next thing we'll do is transfer the whole thing from the blowpipe to a secondary iron called the punty. Punty is just a little bit of glass shaped up into a Q-tip or a dome shape, and we'll attach that to the bottom center of the piece. Hot glass sticks to other things that are hot, especially other hot glass, very easily. But we don't want the punty connection to be too warm because we don't want it to permanently fuse or melt all the way together. We want to be able to easily break it free from the piece once it's completed. So we're going to attach it at a lower temperature point. Catherine and I will both manage the temperature of our glass, making sure that both are warm enough, but not too warm, not too cold either. It's not going to stick at all. We've got to have just the right temperatures. Once we have the two attached, we'll turn together to make sure everything's running along the same line. And then we'll use thermal shock to separate the piece from the blowpipe. That constriction line is a structural weak point. We can create thermal shock in our glass by cooling it too rapidly. A couple drops of water, relate like back to the iron. Cracks and fractures all along that constriction line and the piece breaks free. So all glass shrinks as it cools and expands as it's heated. Each type of glass has a rate at which this occurs. Our soda lime glass expands and contracts at 96. Borosilicate glass, which is a type of glass used for scientific glassware, Pyrex dishes, 
has an expansion rate of 33. So it's much smaller than ours. So it is happening, that expansion and contraction, but just at such a minute rate that we don't have those cracks and breaks in our dishes and scientific glassware. If we made um, you know, a casserole dish out of this glass and stuck it in the oven, it would crack and break off. So it just can't withstand those temperature changes as well as that borosilicate glass can. So we're working with soda lime glass, specially designed for the art studio. It's designed to stay hotter longer, so we have time to do all this manipulating and shaping. But soda lime glass is super common. It's the type of glass used for these window panes, your eyeglasses, the drinking glasses in your kitchen, and the pickle jars in the grocery store. It's everywhere. Formulated to go from solid, or excuse me, molten to solid in a matter of seconds, because machines are using this glass to make all of our pop bottles and pickle jars and all that, and it's super rapid fire. If you ever can catch a video, um, either out here at our innovation center or YouTube's a good spot too, uh, you can see those glass making machines at work. Um, I think it's something like 15 or 1600 light bulbs per minute. I can make two. So, hence the need for the machines. Most glass that we come into contact with today um, is made by machine. So Catherine has rearranged the heat in the glass, so now we've got more heat up at the top of the piece. The bottom of the piece is still warm enough that it's not cracking and breaking, but not so warm that it's moving around. And this is a balance we have to worry about because we don't have to put drops of water on the glass to cause it to fracture and break. It will happen just from being out in the open air. The varying thicknesses throughout the piece would cause each spot to cool at a different rate and therefore contract at a different rate and it actually just rip apart. What we would see, of course, are just fractures in the glass. Um, so if we finish this piece and put it on the table, probably in about 10 or 15 minutes, it would start to fracture. Um, it's not always exciting, an explosion. Sometimes you just hear a tink, and then you see a crack up the side of the piece. So it's, it's not, you're not missing out that, that we're not gonna do that for you, but uh, that's what would happen if we left it out on the tabletop. So up here at the top of the form, we've got the glass nice and hot. Catherine will open up the form, and I think she's gonna cut through the glass wait for it. There it is. Okay, so she's got the duckbill shears. And we call them that because they are, they just look like duckbills. They're designed so the front end of the shears go up like this. That way they don't dig into the glass as you move your way down a cylinder like this. So those are specialized tools, as are most of the tools we use to make our glass. Um, this one's pretty common. We use this at the very beginning. Uh, it is a folded up pile of newspaper. So this is something from our everyday lives, but all the other tools, I think there's a butter knife around here somewhere. But other than that, all of the tools are made specially for glass work. But if it's not going to immediately burst into flames or melt, you can use it to shape glass. I've seen people use pieces of chain link fence. Um, I have copper pipes from the plumbing section of the hardware store in my tool bag. Uh, so you can kind of use anything. We definitely use forks and butter knives a lot. They work really well for sculpting. So, Catherine cut through the top of her piece. She revealed the thick and thin bridges that were created by the optic mold. So when we go into the optic mold, it creates those points, which are our three-dimensional ridges. And those ridges are actually thicker sections in the side wall of the bubble. And that's going to change the final shape. But when we create that constriction line or jack line in the beginning, we kind of smash out any texture. We flatten that texture with the blades and the jacks. So if we want that texture in our final piece, we have to cut away the first, you know, half an inch or so of the vessel where we had placed that constriction line and wiped out our texture. The perfect glass, when you're told you can only have one glass of lemonade a day, find yourself a glass. We're gonna change this shape a little bit more though, and it will be perfect for when someone tells you you can only have one bowl of ice cream for dinner. Again, I guess you could just get a big mixing bowl, but also find some glass maker, it's more fun. So as the glass heats up and becomes more soft and fluid, it's going to start to wiggle around a little bit. Catherine will see it just as you will, uh, but what she'll notice too is the wiggle or the movement in the glass. And this happens to turn faster. Centrifugal force is gonna feel the shape right open. The thick sections or those ridges are heavier. They're gonna travel out a little bit further, Whoa. creating a beautiful scallop edge. Whoa. And she tips it up into the air for a little touch of gravity at the end, creating that folded lip optic combo bowl. Perfect for maybe half a serving of ice cream for one. 
All right, ladies Beautiful. and gentlemen, so if we want to keep this piece all in one piece, we have to cool it down very slowly and evenly so that it doesn't fracture and break. This is going to happen inside of our oven called an annealer. The annealer is right here in the back of the middle of the stage. It sits at 910 degrees Fahrenheit. We fill it up with different pieces of glass all day long. And at the end of the day, we push a button and it slowly cools all the pieces overnight. Um, now you remember I mentioned that this will crack and break if we cool it too fast or if we set it out on the table for you. But it does look very ready for the kitchen table. However, I assure you, it is still well over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh. Nice and warm. So we'll place this into our slow cooling oven it's where it can cool properly. Fahrenheit. Enjoy that half serving of ice cream tomorrow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for Captain Nice friend, dynamic demo. Maybe to set fires on stage. Beat <laughs> stuff. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to conclude our demo. If anybody has a question, stick with us. We'd love to chat with you. If not, please enjoy the rest of your visit here to the party museum. Bye.